Hello. Good afternoon. It's great to have you here. Thank you, whoever did the whistle. Welcome this afternoon uh, to our fifth in the Positive Links series this year. This year, uh, this is meant to be a gathering place for uh, academics, for practitioners of all stripes, and for wonderful students. Um, and we are, the whole flavor and theme of this year is sort of built on this book about how to be a positive leader. And today you're in for a treat because we have uh, a sort of a leading edge thinker in the, in the area of how to unlock resourceful change in organizations. So welcome for those of you who haven't been here before. Um, I am Jane Dutton. I'm one of the co-founders of the Center for Positive Organizations. I'm also the organizer of this series. Um, and it's just been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful ride so far. For those of you who are joining us live, uh, welcome. For those of you who know people who couldn't be here, please uh, remind them that we put these videos up very fast. They're wonderful, high quality, thanks to the people in the back of the room. And so that we're trying to build kind of a reservoir of resources for the center through these high quality videos. Um, so if you haven't been on our website and explored the videos that are there, please do. So um, I played a couple of times this year with different ways to describe the center. So I have a new way. <laughs> this is a, this is a, those of you know, I really got, I got hung up on H's, four H's. This is the three C. So this is the three, three C's take on uh, what, this, what the Center for Positive Organizations does. We're a catalyst, catalyst for new ideas, cat catalyst for new collaborations, catalyst for lots of um, hope in uh, work organizations. We're also a coordinator, so uh, we see ourselves in the business of coordinating and building partnerships with different people and different organizations that have a stake in trying to cultivate flourishing work organizations. And we're also a community, and we take this idea of being a community really seriously. Uh, and you will see, just to show you how responsive we are as a community, not now, but at the end of this, we're going to have he healthy snacks right outside here because we got feedback that our snacks were not healthy enough and they were too far away. So they're <laughs> going to be right here. <laughs> um, uh, I also want to um, be sure to uh, thank Paul and Diane Jones who are sitting right here in the front who have been such important supporters of the Positive Links series over several years. It wouldn't, this series would not be here. It would not be nearly as vibrant as it is without their support. So thank you to the Joneses. Please join me. Um, I also want to uh, remind you, for those who have not bought the book, that the way the book organizes how to be a positive leader is sort of in these four different pathways. Uh, and we have got speakers coming out throughout the year that are exploring these pathways. One is about building positive relationships, about unlocking resources from within, tapping in the good, and creating resourceful change. And Scott Sonnenshine, who's going to be our guest today, is really, as I said, one of the leaders in this idea of resourceful change. Um, I want to therefore transition. Oh, I forgot. A key part of this community is I'm supposed to challenge you to build a high quality connection before I introduce the speaker. So I'm only going to give you 60 seconds. So I'm going to be very rude and I forgot my bell. So that means <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm going to clap for when you need to stop. And I'm giving you 60 seconds to build a connection to someone that you have not connected with so far since you got into the room and try to make it a high quality connection. So go.
30 seconds left. Nice to see you again. Oh, I don't know if you remember me. Yes, I'm Frank. I do. I, I, you're, uh, you're wonderful at coming to me. So I appreciate it. No, <laughs> I'd like to have a longer conversation I sometime. Do, very yeah. much. <laughs> so I'm going to do the rude thing of clapping now. Yeah, everybody went away from me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Disconnect. Okay. Enough connecting. <laughs> Thank you. I love the way people energetically take this up. So hopefully you've, you've created some new pathways for linking after the session today. So now it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Scott Sonnenstein. And for me, this has just been such a wonderful series because I get to meet some of, to re-meet some of uh, the, my favorite people in the field that I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, Scott got his PhD in, ma in management organizations from here in 2007. He w before that, he was at the University of Cambridge where he got his master's and then began at the University of Virginia. Um, he, is, uh, he joined the faculty at Rice University and now has a, a very fine distinction as the Jones School Distinguished Associate Professor of Management. And since it's a C letter day, C letter day, let me use three adjectives to describe Scott. Uh, one, he's incredibly creative. Really, he's one of the most prolific but most creative researchers work, working in the field of organization studies. And I think anyone who's in here, in this room, who has been trained in the field would also say that. Um, he's creative in two, at least two ways. I'm sure there's many, one, many other ways. But one is in the creative use of interesting contexts. So he looks at context from fashion to food trucks, from banks to booksellers, and entrepreneurs to environmentalists. But he's also very creative in his use and generation of theory. And as I've also suggested to you, he's been really instrumental in opening up whole new lines of thought of explaining change in organizations. That's the first C. The second C is a connector. Um, his research has built many bridges, uh, bridges connecting ethics, organization behavior, organization theory, and organizational change and strategy. And final, finally, he's the, uh, the, his final C is he's a collaborator. Uh, and while he's pr provided groundbreaking new ideas about creativity, change, sense-making, and his new work, collaborative competition, he's also nurtured and developed many of us during research collaborations. I consider myself very fortunate to have had the privilege of collaborating with Scott. So he's going to talk to us about resourceful change, and please join me in welcoming him. Before I dive into my materials, I want to just get the energy in the room going by uh, getting you involved a little with your perspective. So I have a very simple exercise. I don't want this to uh, take more than a couple of minutes, uh, but all of you have had the chance to be a participant, uh, maybe also a leader of an organizational change. Uh, what I want you to do is think about a recent time when you were uh, going through an organizational change and just ask yourself uh, two questions. Uh, one is, was it a success or a failure? Uh, and two is, what do you think contributed to this outcome? So just think about you know most recent change event you've been in, and then find someone right next to you and just share stories. And I want this to just take a couple of minutes. So success or failure, what do you think contributed to this outcome? So just take a couple of minutes, find someone next to you, and quickly swap stories.
Okay. I know we can go on and on and, uh, and talk about these stories, but yeah, I, need the, I need the bell. Uh, what I'd like to do, if I can get your attention, please. Um, you know, hopefully what you've done is you now have two contexts to think about uh, change, yours and the one uh, that was shared with you, and I'd like you to have those in the back of your mind uh, as I go through some of my material, and then uh, you know, maybe we'll come back to this at the end, uh, depending on, on our time. So before I dive into uh, resourceful change, I want to start with a couple of uh, starting points about change. Um, we know that organizations uh, need to change. They have a constant need to change because the world around them is always changing. Uh, but unfortunately, most change initiatives fail to meet their stated objectives. So we have this great need, but organizations tend not to be very effective at this. And actually, we can do this. Uh, show of hands, how many of the examples um, that you offered uh, were uh, successes? Just show of hands. And how about failures? Yeah. So even in a room that's, of course, predisposed to be really positive, we still end up with uh, you know, picking stories that are, are quite a bit failures. Uh, we also know that change often depletes resources, whether it be time, motivation, or energy, when in fact it's intended to be able to replenish these resources. And then finally, we know that shifts in the environment, whether they be internal, like culture, or external, like markets, can render what seems to be a very valuable resource to be quickly less valuable. And so this is why we want to think about how a resourcefulness lens uh, could provide a new perspective of change. Now it's important to, uh, to keep in mind of you know, the way that the field, and when I say the field, I'm talking about uh, not just many academic theories of change, but many practitioner theories of change go back to uh, work from the 1950s and the psychologist uh, Kurt Lewin. And he proposed a very simple and powerful model of change. But what I want to argue is that underneath this very simplistic model are some dangerous lurking assumptions. So when you think of Lewin, he describes change, and we can think about this metaphorically as, as an ice cube. We're going to unfreeze employees um, so we can uh, move them. And the, the image I want you to keep in mind here is it's one like taking a blowtorch to employees. We want to really melt the ice, uh, generate that urgency so we could then shape them, introduce the change, and shape them and manipulate them in the way we want them to be manipulated, and then we're going to stick them in the deep freezer. So we go from blowtorch to manipulation to deep freezer. Now, let's look at some of those assumptions. You know, one is, uh, you know, we got to take out that blowtorch because employees, their natural inclination is to resist change, often for irrational reasons. Uh, they don't want to depart from that status quo. That's why we got to you know, stick that blowtorch to them. Uh, ch change. We, we come in and when we talk about change, we tend to talk about very management-centric, very top-down planning perspectives that, again, treats employees as the object of this change, not as uh, capable partners that also participate in this change. And then, of course, we want to take out that deep freezer and stick them back in again, and we want them to be tied to a new status quo. So what are we essentially doing is we're moving them from blind followers of one status quo to blind followers of another status quo. You know, from the, from the blowtorch to the change to the deep freezer until six years, six months, six quarters, six weeks. And I've even heard six days when we've got to begin this process all over again because it turns out that, you know, you know what generated the need for the blowtorch and then the deep freezer uh, is completely different and we've got to start this process all over again. And you wonder why cynicism to organizational change is a major stumbling block, because it seems like there's a change of the month or even a change of the week. So what I'm going to do is I want to take you in a tour of some of my work to think about change from a different perspective. And I should start out by saying that the type of work I do is what's called inductive field work, which means I try and find uh, contexts where I can uh, develop some insights about uh, new ways of thinking about change. And the way I like to think about an inductive field researcher is much like you would think about a detective. You're trying to find clues to solve a puzzle. And you go in with you know, maybe a, a guess at what you think is happening, but over time you generate more and more clues and start to be able to have a clearer picture of what you think is unfolding. So I want to start off with, uh, with one uh, context um, that I'm going to call Boutico. 
And this was a company that was thriving. And when I started my uh, research there, it was right in the throes of the last uh, recession in you know, 2010, where it's very common for retail organizations to, to go out of business. You know, lots of big retailers went out of business, including, of course, uh, one here right, in, uh, right here in Ann Arbor. Uh, but this was a company that was thriving. And as a function of these businesses uh, going under, you often had a situation that looked like this. This is a barren, lifeless store, right? It used to be uh, full of commerce and full of activity, an employment center, and now it was simply you know, four walls and some windows uh, and flooring. And what Boutico would do is, every week, they would come into one of these uh, barren stores. Uh, they would ship about a 24-foot truck full of boxes that looked like this and they would turn it into a boutique that was absolutely thriving. So this is kind of you know, clue number one in my detective story about uh, resourcefulness, of how you can go from the barren to the, to the, um, the life uh, and really uh, vi uh, vivacious um, store. Clue number two was, you know, how are they accomplishing this work? This was not a dedicated set of employees. These were employees that were cobbled together from close by stores who were brought in over the mere matter of four days and transformed the empty barren store into the store full of life. That would mean unpacking all of these cardboard boxes, displaying the merchandise, uh, doing the fixtures, uh, doing uh, some of the information technology capabilities. So again, the question is, over the mere matter of four days, what was it about this organization that's able to uh, you know, create this lifeless store into this store full of life. Clue number three, uh, you know, sometimes in my work I, I go and I, I observe, uh, and it's, I was there to observe one of these new store opening teams to try and figure out what it was that they were doing. Well, that worked for about five minutes when I was told that there was no way I was going to just sit there and observe and not do anything. And I was essentially transformed from what I thought was, you know, you know, an identity as an academic to being someone who was working in a chain of women's boutique stores, which I probably never would have predicted. So again, you know, by the end of my four days, of course, you know, I was very comfortable, you know, pairing jewelry and dresses and, you know, putting together mannequins and folding scarves. So again, another, you know, I was transformed from someone who was pretty invaluable in this context to this organization to someone who at least was beginning to, uh, to get some productive work done. All right, my next clue uh, was this. I was unpacking one of these boxes and I stumbled upon this. I had absolutely no idea what this is. Maybe some of you uh, know what this is. I, you know, I started playing with it and bending it and, and twisting it. Um, and what I learned that this was, was what's called moldable jewelry. Now, this thing became you know, an object, but also a metaphor for what I began to study in the organization. Because you know, as, as, as something that you, know, you can manipulate and turn into different things, this is you know, the ultimate example of a resourceful product, right? You can make a brooch out of it, you can make a hair braid out of it, you can make a necklace out of it, um, you can make a bracelet out of it. Um, I unpacked this box and I had nowhere to display this moldable jewelry. So what I did is I started playing with it and I created something that uh, you know, looks like this, which was a, a place to hang other moldable jewelry. So I transformed what was a product to be a fixture to display that product. And for me, that began to open up insights into resourceful behavior that was happening throughout the organization. So what you do in inductive work is you spend some time in the field and then you want to step back and go to the literature and try and you know, understand you know, what is this puzzle that you're trying to solve. And so I thought, well, you know, moldable jewelry, and then I thought back to my time as a fan of a 1980s action hero, and you don't usually think about putting these things together, but that again is a principle of resourcefulness, and you ask yourself, what would moldable jewelry and a 1980s action hero get you? Uh, and you would get, you know, a marriage between MacGyver and a piece of jewelry. And it's that juxtaposing, you know, these set of images that helped me return to the literature and start to think about a different way of thinking about resources. And of course, I had some really good help here. There's been some remarkable work that, uh, you know, in particular, Martha Feldman has done and Monica Werlein, who I know is also here, on thinking about resources as being fixed or dynamic. 
So when you think about a fixed resource, you know, its meaning is very static. You know, a chair is something that you sit on. Whereas a dynamic perspective allows multiple meanings uh, for a resource. When you use a fixed resource, you know, over time it eventually degrades. But in a dynamic perspective, you know, you're constantly generating and recreating a resource. Uh, so you create, you might use it, but then you recreate it. You access resources in the fixed perspective largely through thinking about it because you're thinking about what is the dominant way that people use a resource. What do people usually do with a chair? They sit on it. Whereas in a dynamic perspective, it's all action-based. You experiment. Just like I experimented with this piece of moldable jewelry, you experiment with your resources in your organizations and you come up with new ways of using those. So the practice that you end up uh, from the fixed perspective is when you don't have something, a resource to solve a problem, you seek more resources. Whereas in the dynamic perspective, you allow yourself to stretch the resources you already have, which unlocks new possibilities for doing things that you otherwise might not imagine. So what I do is I want to share with you uh, the four S's that I've come up with for resourceful change. Uh, strengthen your resources, uh, spark positive prophecies, shape improvisational capabilities, and shift the stories. All right, so strengthen your resources. Right, again, you go through that, that uh, paradigm of the, of the ice cube and you think about taking that blowtorch. But what you don't recognize, and you know, this, is, this is also present in like, economic theories of creative destruction, where you've got to take down the old to start something new. But often there's a hidden gem in there. So when you think about strengthening your resources, instead of too quickly throwing away resources, uh, and taking the blowtorch, I want you to substitute the blowtorch with a chisel and think about reshaping and remolding so you can find ways of repurposing existing resources to make them more valuable. And let me return to an example from Boutico uh, to show you how this, how this worked. I'll tell you the story of one of my informants, uh, who I'll call Ethan, who was faced with a problem that you know, a store manager in a retail setting would fret. He had an underperforming piece of merchandise and let me give you his words, because he does a much better job telling the story than I can. So he says, We got these ridiculously inferior tube dresses that were completely sheer. You couldn't wear them with anything, and the straps were falling off them on the, uh, on the hangers. We couldn't sell them, and the company had ordered tons of them. And so I look at them and think, Crap, we need to sell these. So I cut all the straps off of them, I rolled them up and merchandised them on a mannequin. I made a sign, beach cover-ups, and we blew through 50, 60, 70 of them really, really fast. You have to look at a product and take it as a challenge sometimes. So when I get stuff that I think is personally garbage, I look at it as a challenge. How am I going to make this work? <laughs> so through the action of cutting the scissors, right, he's physically altering the resource, but then he's also cognitively relabeling it from dress to beachwear and solves what seems like an invaluable resource and makes it a very valuable resource and the product goes on to become a really strong seller. The question is how? How do organizations enable you know, this cutting off the straps? Well, one of the things I find in my research is the importance of psychological ownership. So I'm not talking about financial ownership, although that, that might help as well, but I'm talking about helping employees understand uh, and appreciate ownership of their work and ownership of their context, right? You can imagine, of course, the risk that an employee takes by physically altering a dress. In most retail settings, that would be called damaging a product. In this, it was very different. So the CEO, for example, likes to talk about ownership and he talks about how it comes out of necessity because we were very frugal-minded. We couldn't afford the infrastructure to put the people and the processes necessary to have that amount of control over the stores. We didn't have the staff to do it. We didn't have the resources to do it. So it starts off as a disadvantage for this organization. Not having enough infrastructure and control mechanism ends up spawning a culture that becomes very adaptive, that they're able to maintain as the organization grows over time. And now they can, of course, afford these types of control mechanisms as they've grown to a larger entity, but they don't have those uh, in place. 
Uh, and so, you know, Ethan, you know, for his part, you know, credits that same thing where he talks about, you know, obvious the original intent was they wanted us to be everyone in the field. He means everyone, even the part-time worker, to be a business owner. All right, spark positive prophecies. Oftentimes what you see during change is a set of negative prophecies where you have this tug of war between change agents and employees with the change agents assuming there's going to be strong resistance to change. And the idea is avoid creating dunces by putting dunce caps on employees. And what I mean by that is don't set expectations that employees will resist change because it's those expectations that end up becoming self-fulfilling. So what I want to share with you now is in a different setting, uh, some research uh, that Upal Delaki and I have done where we went in and we asked employees to tell us their expectations and interpretations of the change. And I'm going to share with you uh, two employees uh, from the study. Um, one is going to be called Rebecca Resistor and we'll meet Betty Believer very soon. Now, these are real people. Their names are disguised. And it's important to note that they work in the same context, so not only the same organization, but the same store. Uh, they have the same exact job. They make the same amount of money. Uh, they've been with the company, give or take six, six months, for the same time, and they're around the same age. So a lot of similarities, but very different interpretations and expectations about the change. So Rebecca Resistor asks, you know, what's the point of the change? It's harmful to the company. I wasn't given any adequate reason for it. The change confuses people. And for the future, I don't think much will change. So there's that cynicism that we talked about. Betty Believer says, I enjoy the fresh appearance of the new store. I like the increased impact the marketing has on the store. It helps us align the stores and the marketing and the promotions and we can benefit more from this stuff very different interpretations. And what we found when we dived into the data is the importance of positive expectations and how they can make employees uh, more likely to engage in both required behaviors as well as these above and beyond discretionary behaviors. Uh, so for example, positive expectations can create a set of psychological resources, namely commitment, identification, and self-efficacy. So in other words, the expectations that employees have can go on and create the resources, the psychological resources they need to be able to effectively implement change. So then, of course, the question becomes is, you know, how do we create more Betty Believers, um, you know, as opposed to the Rebecca Resistors? And, you know, one of the key things we find is the importance of finding hidden benefits. So how do you find hidden benefits in challenges to create positive expectations that then start this cycle where you build the psychological resources that give you what you need to be effective and competent at change. So job challenges, you know, you might reframe those as learning opportunities. Job changes, you might think about new relationships you can form. And I'm sure that you'll have, you know, your own way of finding benefits in the context that you discussed, you know, at the beginning of the session. But the idea is finding benefits, sometimes these benefits are hidden, uh, but to the extent that you do find them, you create these expectations that start this positive amplitative cycle. Okay. The third S is to think about shaping improvisational capabilities. Now, one of the urges that I think a lot of folks have when it comes time to thinking about change is to try and plan and plan and plan and try and anticipate every possible contingency. But of course the world has far more uncertainty than we're able to plan for. So the idea is to, you know, shape improvisational capabilities as an extra capability to be able to deal with these situations. But planning itself also creates some dangerous blind spots. So for example, you know, how we implement plans themselves can shape our environment. 
right? Uh, sense-making scholars, in particular Carl Weick likes to talk about the concept of enactment, right? The idea that our, our, our actions are not benign to our environment. They shape our environment, they shape our challenges and opportunities in those environments. So when we start acting on a plan, we're not only acting on a plan, but we're inevitably changing the environment around us, and that could be in ways that make our plan irrelevant. Another situation is when we're dealing with change events, there's uncertainty and we make some simplifying assumptions, which is perfectly reasonable to do. What's not perfectly reasonable to do is to forget that there were simplifying assumptions that we might have then inputted into a model and then we look at the output of that model and we take the output of that model as a complete truism. Forgetting the fact that we had to make some simplifying assumptions in the first place because the model doesn't lie. Right? And my, my, my sense is that this happens happens quite a bit from, uh, from your reaction to, uh, to that comment. And the idea is, you know, we try and create these plans and we make these simplifying assumptions, um, but we don't want to reify the plan because that creates some dangerous blind spots. And we can think about this in, uh, in the retail setting uh, from uh, two examples, one of which I'm guessing you're quite familiar with, uh, the other you might be less familiar with. And what we, we and I have been doing recently is trying to re-envision a theory of change that's fundamentally based off of experimentation. And when I say experimentation, not experimentation just at the top, but experimentation throughout the entire organization. How you develop organizations that have this distributed capability where everyone's running these micro experiments to learn about uh, the environment and how it's changing and how to adjust uh, the firm. So, you know, in um, a couple decades ago, the British retailer Asda, which is primarily a uh, grocery store that uh, um, was selling uh, high volume, low margin products, uh, went through a change where they decided to try and get more upmarket uh, customers and sell higher margin products. Completely uh, tanked, uh, tanked the business. Uh, new CEO comes in and starts thinking about a change process but fundamentally ignites that process by developing practices that allow employees all over the chain, uh, you know, all across the stores, to engage in these micro experiments to be able to learn about the environment and reshape what the organization does. Now, those of you familiar with, uh, with JCPenney and what's recently happened will recognize this as a stark contrast, right? So Ron Johnson, of course, the uh, former head of Apple's retail division, very successful in Apple, comes in with a change plan to turn around JCPenney. And of course, it's his change plan and his change plan. I'm gonna emphasize the his part. He comes in with very little input, um, almost no experimentation, you know, and puts you know, all of you know, you know, the, the plan to work uh, with, uh, without any experimentation or testing and uh, you know, puts the company at uh, risk, right? I mean, their, their revenues are down by, by billions and it's, it's unclear whether or not this organization uh, is going to survive. But again, there's no sense of being able to adjust uh, on the spot, no sense of experimentation. Now, of course, J.C. Penney decides to, you know, get rid of Ron Johnson after about 18 months and bring back its former CEO, who they deemed incapable of handling the challenges in the first place. But that's that's probably for a separate uh, conversation. Hey. Let me talk to you about another way of thinking about uh, improvisational capabilities, and this is with some uh, current research that I'm doing in the context of gourmet food trucks. And um, gourmet food trucks, um, which I didn't know much about a couple years ago, are you know, remarkable organizations for a number of reasons. Uh, one is their outputs are absolutely amazing, right? You imagine you know, a small little box uh, that's turning out restaurant quality food uh, in conditions where it often gets about 130 degrees plus inside these boxes. You can imagine in a summer anywhere, you take a metal tin box and you put some industrial strength cooking equipment in it um, and no air conditioning and you can imagine the working conditions inside that box. Uh, but it's more, than just, it's more than just some of those uh, struggles, it's also trying to create a viable business. But what I want to do is I want to share with you just uh, an excerpt from the very first interview I did in this context uh, that to me signaled there's got to be something really special collectively. Right now we're not talking about organizations, but I want to think about resourceful change at a, at a more collective and industry level. There's got to be something going on that's explaining 
uh, what's happening. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the challenges that came out in this, in this first interview, and then we'll talk about what it means. So these are two uh, partners uh, who operate the truck. And so the first one starts off by saying, you know, when you drive, everything falls from the ceiling and comes out of your fridge. Your grease falls down, you spill oil, your freezer opens, and everything pours out of it. The sauces come off the top. You hit a bump and the fryer comes down. The grill comes down. Eggs fly out the side and the barbecue sauce flies out. We get back at 3.30 in the morning and we're cleaning up eggs and barbecue sauce. We've got to work the next morning. The truck life. You've just got to let it go. Yes, we learn to let a lot of stuff go. If you're a stubborn person, you're in the wrong business. Stuff goes wrong no matter what. There's no foolproof. We got to the place the other day and our generator didn't work. Somehow, we always get it done. Somehow, some way, we get stuff done and get it done right. And so the question is, you know, one is, you know, how can you plan an environment like this? I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's incredibly hard. But then it also begs the second question is, well, if you're not planning, how is it that you're getting this stuff done? You're a resource-constrained organization. You know, on a good day, this stuff might happen. On a bad day, it might rain and you'll have bought all of this uh, perishable goods and have nowhere to sell it. So what, you know, what are these folks doing that allows them uh, to, um, to be successful? So um, what I've been doing in this research is to fundamentally focus on how the collective industry has changed the meaning of a relationship, particularly a competitor relationship, and has resourced it into being much more valuable. So I mean, of course, I find stuff that you might expect where you get a lot of experimentation around the menu, around marketing, and around the strategy. But it's really about kind of thinking about competitive relationships much more resourcefully that I think has changed how this collective can be successful. And it starts off with a recognition of the abundance that's around them. So you read, you know, I read to you the quote about how difficult this situation is. These folks also work 18-hour days. Uh, they're struggling to pay their bills, especially when they start. But the mentality and the mindset that they embrace is that the resources around them are abundant. Now, to us as outsiders, we might look at this as a very bizarre statement to make. You might think you don't have a brick and mortar restaurant, uh, you don't have a lot of capital, uh, you don't have a lot of employees, you don't have a lot of customers maybe when you're starting off. But the mentality that they embrace is what we have around us is really abundant and we're going to appreciate what we have as opposed to trying to seek out what we don't have. And I think this is a, 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 an important clue that allows them to get to that next level where they essentially repurpose what a competitive relationship is and turn it into a relationship based on genuine friendship. And that changes the entire dynamics of how this industry works. So let me give you an example. I'll start off with a ritual uh, that these folks do uh, called the food swap. And a food swap is simply a truck going to another truck and offering their food for free. And then the other food truck will also in turn provide their food for free. And again, this seems like a very simplistic practice. But what it does is a couple of things. Uh, one, it boosts uh, positive affect because you're literally breaking bread with each other. Two, it allows you to get to know who are seemingly your competitors on a more personal level. And this has the function of changing the relationship by putting a face uh, to a name. And it's also this really deeply rich experience. You think about, you know, eating is a very intimate activity to do with someone. Now you're eating someone's creation with the person who created it. So you've got, you know, this positive affect, this really rich experience, uh, and this information uh, that's uh, unfolding through these types of exchanges. And this starts a relationship building process that over time changes people's identities such that the way they think about what they're doing is much more at the collective or the industry level. You know, we're all gourmet food truckers versus, you know, on this particular truck or on that particular truck. So you get a, 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 a strong collective identity that enables a whole host 
of these seemingly selfless behaviors that are quite remarkable. People are going out of their way to help their competitors, which again is really important because you're in this resource constraint environment. So let me give you an example of what this would look like. And we're going to have to venture into the world of pizza. Now, when you are a pizza food truck, having cheese is a really important resource. It's pretty hard to make pizza without cheese. Well, as this informant is going to talk about, he ran out of cheese. And he didn't have the ability to go out and get the cheese himself. Nor did he have the resource of an employee to do it. So what does he do? He turns to the collective and the collective resourcefulness of the food truck community. So he's going to talk about George, who's one of his competitors. George from Cold Fusion saved my bleep at a major event on Sunday. Bought me two bags of cheese. I've looked at everything and I was like, I don't think I have enough cheese. And I was right, I didn't. If he wouldn't have had brought me those two bags, I would have made 430 less dollars than I did on Sunday. I sent out a tweet at 5 a.m. saying, anybody want to sell me a bleep case of mozzarella provolone blend? Help, Mayday, please retweet. <laughs> George answered the call. Again, because of this, this collective identity that they've built, runs out, grabs him the cheese, and then refuses to be compensated for the supplies. Let me give you another example. We'll talk about an example where a Mexican food truck was experimenting with Korean beef. And the Mexican food truck experimenting with Korean beef had inadvertently parked next to the Korean food truck that was having a Mexican themed day. <laughs> so now you have a very different market dynamic where you've got two firms from very different perspectives essentially offering the same product. So here's the, uh, the Mexican uh, truck selling Korean beef. Now, one time I stopped and I did not know the other truck was Korean. I know the guy. He's like my friend. I did not know he's going to be there. I had my Korean meat. I marinate everything. And I was like, I went and say, you know what? I'm not going to sell my Korean taco because you are here. We are a community. I told them I'm not going to sell it. Again, kind of the, the underlying story too is this guy is really, I don't know if you can tell in the quote, but he's really proud of his Korean meat. Uh, this was something that uh, he had um, uh, recently created by himself and he was really excited to go out there and, uh, and test this thing, but he pulls back using language like friend and community, which is not normally the way that we, we would think about competitive relationships. But again, through the formation of this collective identity, the collective has resourced what a competitive relationship is and turned it into something a lot more valuable. All right, our final S to talk about is shift to stories. I want you to think about you know, changes that you've been involved in, and we'll soon come back to, uh, to the stories that you opened up with, and think about kind of the core metaphor that you use to think about change. Now, the dominant way we tend to think about this is through plans, and that's going to have some dramatic impacts on what we think and what we do with change, and we'll contrast that to stories. So when you think about a plan, you think about the core action of a plan, what do you do to a, com a plan? You commit to a plan. You want your employees to commit to a plan. And we know from research in uh, you know, social psychology, Robert Cialdini's work you know, illustrates this really well. You, know, you have your active, voluntary, public commitment, and you're much more likely to follow through. So plans, when you commit them, even if they no longer make sense, even if they were based on faulty assumptions, even if you've enacted an environment that now looks very different than when you first started, you're going to stay committed to that plan. When you think about metaphorically what you're doing, not as planning, but as a story, what does that do? Well, stories are all about telling and updating. So embedded in a story is this mechanism because each time you tell a story, you inevitably change that story. 
right? You, you, you see this illustrated with something simple like the telephone game, of course. Uh, but every time you tell a story, there's these little updates and new information that gets uh, added to it. You think about who is the author of plans? Usually it's top managers, right? You know, Ron Johnson comes in, he's got his plan. But when you think about metaphorically shifting to a story, you know, anyone can tell stories. They're what narrative theorists like to call plurivocal, right? Open to, open to everyone to tell. What are your standards for knowledge when you think about a story? Well, a story is strategically ambiguous, right? There's, there's multiple ways of interpreting it. Whereas with a plan, sometimes they're dangerously clear. In fact, so, so clear that they don't account for possible contingencies. How about in terms of recall? No, no one really remembers plans, right? They're, they're often forgettable. But, you know, narrative psychology teaches us that the story form is a really compelling way of memorizing things. So they're much more, much more memorable. How about knowledge? You think about plans, they're reified. I mean, just go back and look at the language that gets used, right? It's often the third person uh, impersonal pronoun because they're meant to be objective and reified. It takes out the actor who's doing the action. You know, whereas stories, it's very clear who the actor is, so you can tie the actor to the action. And your success criteria for plans are, you know, around accuracy. You know, you want, you want accurate scanning so you can come up with the, with the right plan and then build effective control mechanisms uh, in there. Whereas stories, your standards are, is it a persuasive story? Is it a compelling story? You go back to that opening example I talked about with Ethan, right, there was no formal control mechanism, there was just a really compelling story about ownership. And then you ended up with this remarkable behavior you wouldn't otherwise expect when Ethan cuts off the straps. So now that I've seeded the conversation with the four S's of resourceful change, what I'd like you to do is go back to your conversation partner and go back to that story that you recalled and ask yourself one additional question. How might a resourceful change perspective helped with the change initiative that you described? So take a couple of minutes and mull over that, please.
All right. Uh, we have a we have a few moments, uh, folks. Uh, we we have we have a few moments. Uh, um, if anyone would like to share uh, their answer to this question, I'd be uh, you know very interested in uh, in learning about um, how you've thought about resourceful change in your own situations. And of, of course, you know, with, with that vulnerability might come opportunities as you invite other people to co-author that story with you and they see that you've made yourself vulnerable and they make themselves vulnerable and it can really change the dynamics of, of relationships. Yeah, really good example. Anyone else? Yeah. So we were talking about the difficulty of institutionalizing this, like, you know, that you may be able to resource it right at the beginning, but how do you you know, continuously allow for this to, to um, stay in a resourceful space. Yeah. Um, you know, what I, what I find in both the example of food trucks as well as in the example of, of boutiques is, you know, I've been observing these behaviors for, uh, you know, for a couple of years now in, in both of these contexts. And these practices become institutionalized, right? So food swaps is something that, you know, the industry started off with but that still very much lives as new people come into the market and some people exit the market. So some of these practices and rituals stay and they serve as a, you know, a constant way of continuing to um, you know, help shape the way that people think about uh, relationships. Same thing at Boutico, where this need for ownership was very much a necessity. Right? This is a resource-constrained organization when it started as a family business. But you know, over time they grew, uh, they IPO'd, they had a you know, big infusion of capital, and they've maintained this idea of ownership, and they've you know, developed practices such as, you know, I'll give you an example, um, most retail organizations have what's called a planogram. It's a, it's a map for how you'll go lay out the store. It's a resource that the company could not afford in the beginning. As they could afford it, they refused to provide that resource to unlock other resources, namely, the individual creativity of their employees to solve situations like we saw with Ethan. Um, so, I mean, you know, we might see resourcefulness in constrained environments more clearly because, you know, necessity often creates a need for that. But through these practices, they absolutely can persist as, you know, more traditional resources uh, become available and still be very adaptive and important. You know, Boutico's entire model is predicated on, you know, creating, you know, this heterogeneity that comes from these resourceful moments. If they were to interject more traditional resources, I don't know what it would do to their business model. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that, I thought I thought I saw a hand up. Okay. Well, so I'll leave you with uh, the image that uh, it's not only people, organizations, and industries that could be resourceful, it's even animals. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>